Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to do the Sabaton history for the final solution. This is a rougher, darker topic, so they're given a content warning at the beginning. Um, yeah, you all know what it is. Like, this is this is a, a rough topic, so it's probably going to be pretty, pretty rough, but um, I'm anxious to get into it and hear kind of what what they talk about specifically. So let's go ahead and get started. Sabaton history, the final solution. This episode of Sabaton history is about one of the darkest chapters in human history. This is the final solution. It happened on November 9th, 1938. The National Socialist leadership of Germany had gathered in Munich to commemorate the Beer Hall push, Adolf Hitler's failed attempt to grab power 15 years earlier. Then the news arrived that Ernst von Ratz had succumbed to his wounds. He was a young German diplomat who had been shot in the German embassy in Paris by Herschel Greenspan, a Polish-German Jew. Joseph Goebbels, German propaganda minister, now addressed the party officials and spoke vividly of a global Jewish conspiracy that aimed to push Germany into a war with France. Outraged, the men rushed to the telephones and urged their local Nazi henchmen to act. What followed was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass a nationwide pogrom against Jewish communities in Germany. A thousand synagogues and prayer rooms were vandalized or set on fire. 7,500 shops were wrecked and looted. Jewish neighborhoods were attacked and 90 Jews were killed. It was the climax. Yeah, and so a, a couple of things here. One, there was also this finagling behind the scenes from, you know, Nazi leadership to prevent insurance claims for any of the damage, right? The whole thing was it has to be paid for out of the pockets of the the Jews, essentially, which obviously the, the insurance groups got on board for. They weren't going to have to pay it out. But, you know, property damage is one of those things where if you have insurance, it can it can cover for it. That was nixed by by the party, so that wasn't able to be done, obviously. And I talked during the song about this kind of slow step to hell that that the Reich took the rest of the German population on. So when you when you're outside of that of that slow step and you look at the end result, you're like, what in the hell happened? Like, how is that possible? It, it just, it doesn't make sense rationally, right? Um, <clears throat> I've talked before about how I've heard, you know, multiple times the Jewish Bolshevik movement and the Jewish capitalist movement. Those were two seemingly coherent thought processes at the same time from the Reich. Even though those two things are polar opposite from each other, and after World War II would would butt heads for the next, you know, half century. It's just a, I, I don't know, the, the whole thing is really bizarre. But, you know, it didn't start... It didn't start where it ended. It started with this, with these passing of laws where, um, and you know, there's, this is rarely talked about, but there's a huge eugenics movement all around the world at this time. The idea, this like ethnocentric, like idea of genetics and evolution, it is not just a German thing. And so they're not start, like, nobody is starting from zero. 
they're starting with their already like preconceived ideas and biases and things like that. Ironically, the eugenics movement was considered like super science, like it was super scientific. It was like the cutting edge of science and it's, it's just totally bizarre, right? The whole thing is totally bizarre, but that is to say that it was, this was not just a German thing all around the world. You have these different groups and movements and, you know, scientific agencies that are diving into and even promoting the idea of eugenics. Of years of anti-Jewish policies and harassment, Adolf Hitler's chancellorship had turned anti-Semitic rhetoric into state policy. Since mid-1935, Jews faced increased harassment. Under Reinhard Heydrich, the German Security Service, SD, began monitoring... That guy was a super dick. Um, he ends up getting assassinated. I'm blanking on where it was. He's in his car and I think he's driving to the airport and ends up getting assassinated. But when you hear victims basically talk about Reinhard Heydrich from the time, they are scared to death of him. Every time he comes around, they are scared to death of, of who he is as a person. Jewish organizations and affairs more closely. To the Nazis, Judaism was not only totally alien to German culture, but also the natural enemy of National Socialism. Hitler believed in an international Jewry that pulled the strings behind both Soviet Bolshevism and Anglo-Saxon capitalism. And See? See? Both of them. I don't understand it, but, but both of them. Germany must free itself from their influence once and for all. For the Führer's planned cleansing of the Reich, Heydrich recruited Adolf Eichmann, a former desk worker at Dachau concentration camp. It would be his job to implement the stricter policies aimed at excluding Jews from the German economy and everyday public life. By I would... So the story of Mossad going and getting Eichmann after the war is incredible to me. They made a movie about it a, a while back. I, I would love, love, love to do it on the channel. It's such an incredible story. It's, it's one of those things that's literally like made for a movie. And so, yeah, I would, I would love to do it. The story is incredible. If you haven't, you know, if you don't know what happened, go look it up or you can go watch the movie, um, which I'm, I'm sure is great. But yeah, incredible story going and getting who was widely considered the architect of the final solution. Making their lives as miserable as possible, they would push the Jews to voluntarily emigrate from the Reich. They were not to feel welcome nor safe in Germany and public opinion was to be swayed accordingly. Over the following years, Jews were denied entry into theaters, into cinemas, museums, and restaurants. They were banned from using public transportation and even owning bicycles. Shopping was restricted to one hour a day and there was a strict curfew in the evening. And Jews were not allowed to buy certain things like cigars or flowers. They were not allowed to own telephones or typewriters either. They eventually had to wear a yellow badge to visibly differentiate themselves from everyone else, and they paid extra taxes. The Nuremberg racial laws of 1935 were set in place to legally segregate the Jews. Citizenship was restricted to people of German blood. Jews were reduced to mere subjects of the Reich without political rights. They were fired from this was, these laws were used against uh, Gehring in the Nuremberg trials. It's, a, it's kind of an interesting turn of events during the Nuremberg trials because Gehring actually does decently well at the beginning of the trials. Um, this is something that, that is used against him, is these laws that essentially made it to where it was not legally viable to 
treat Jews the same. It was it, they basically made it illegal for Jews to be treated as anybody else. From the civil service, teachers and professors were ousted. Jewish-owned shops were attacked. The Hitler Youth Organization chased Jews out of public spaces. The laws were so strictly enforced that even the smallest misconduct could lead to imprisonment or worse. Jews lived under a constant fear of inspections, house searches, and death threats. And then Kristallnacht happened. Hitler, however, was furious at Goebbels about inciting all the violence in the streets. An unregulated mob roaming the streets not only discredited Nazi authority, but also had a sobering effect on the German people. Many bystanders were shocked by the uncontrolled violence and the lawless behavior of the mob. Worse for Hitler, they felt sympathy for the Jews that were manhandled and humiliated by the Nazi party members. Hitler actively forbade any such organized pogroms in the future. The Jews, he insisted, were to be expelled from Germany through laws and edicts and detained far from the public eye. Over the next months, Jews who had broken the laws were sent to concentration camps, to Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen, which had previously housed political prisoners and actual criminals. Now the majority of the inmates were Jews. The fate of the Jews was to be tightly bound to Hitler's ambitions. On the road to war, the Fuhrer stylized himself as something of a prophet. In his speeches, he repeatedly warned of international Jewish influence and that if the Jews would steer Germany into another world war, then they would not survive to see its end. It seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy as by December 1941, Hitler had invaded the Soviet Union and declared war on the United States, but his belief in the international conspiracy remained, and his war became a war against Jewish life itself. On December 20th, 1941, in a villa outside Berlin, the Wannsee Conference began. Prominent Nazi party members met with officials from the Reich Main Security Office and from the occupied territories. Yeah, this is where the quote-unquote final solution is decided. Now, after the war is over, everybody points fingers at everybody else, but... It's it's clear who was at this conference and what it was what what it was supposed to accomplish. And so it's it's really it's it's hard to talk about, but this is where it was decided that the final solution was going to be carried out in the way it was carried out. Here they would decide once and for all how to answer their Jewish question. The discussions were to offer, quote, clarity on questions of principle and the, quote, preparation of the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. Emigration was not enough anymore. The war had changed Judenpolitik to something far, far more sinister. Authority over the final solution was given to the SS. Its leader, Heinrich Himmler, envisioned first Europe-wide deportations of Jews from the West to the East. Eichmann's office was ordered to prepare the removal of hundreds of thousands of Jews from Germany, Austria, Bohemia, and Moravia to the overcrowded ghettos of Eastern Europe. Since the war began in September 1939, the Jews of Galicia, the Vaterland, and Poland, organized as the General Gouvernement, had been forced to live in segregated residential districts. But even though they were impoverished and cramped together in appalling living conditions, these Jewish communities survived. The final solution was to deny them even that. SS doctors now came into the ghettos to sort the residents into two categories. The first category was for young and healthy Jews who were able to work for the German war effort. The second was for those that could not, the old, the weak, the sick. These people were to be liquidated. The regular concentration camps had already improvised 
special treatment programs. That is a euphemism for the outright murder of Jews that could no longer work. Jews that were sent from the Woj ghetto to the Chelmno camp were herded up a ramp and through a door. Behind that door, they entered the dark back compartment of a gas van. On their drive to a remote location, the men and women were asphyxiated, either with bottled carbon monoxide gas or exhaust fumes piped into the compartment. Once they reached the designated burial ground, a group of Jewish prisoners was ordered to drag the dead from the van into excavated pits. At the end of the day, those workers had to enter the pit as well and were shot dead. The Belzec death camp was the first installation for mass murder on an industrial scale. Belzec was enclosed by fences of barbed wire, and watchtowers, and when trains full of Jews arrived, usually an SS officer stood in front of the crowd and reassured them that they would only remain in Belzac for a short time. Yeah, so this is something I kind of want to hit on. I watched a a couple of documentaries and interviews about uh, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, right? And you had some older Israeli political leaders who essentially said that young Israelis were ha- like they didn't understand and and like didn't want to talk about what had happened in the Holocaust, right? And he said that the idea was they just couldn't understand like how this happened on such a large scale without a a massive like fight fighting back, right? Well, a couple of things on that. One, there absolutely was fighting back there were resistance groups within ghettos uh, that that did happen. But also, I think that's the idea, that thought process is, is a misunderstanding of how this was done. Deception was used until the very, very end. Deception to the point that at some of these death camps, when people undressed for the quote-unquote shower and handed over their valuables, they were given a receipt so that they would be able to get their valuables back once they got out. Like, that's how much deception was put into it all the way to the very, very end. And so, when you don't know what's coming... It, it, it doesn't seem like the same thing, right? Like, sure, there would probably be massive, massive pushback and, and huge revolts if everybody knows that they're all getting marched to their death. But they just don't. That's, that's just not the reality of their situation. And so, I don't know, that, that quote from that guy really kind of surprised me about how He said that younger Israelis felt almost ashamed of it. Now, this was obviously a while back uh, that that interview took place. But I guess I had just never really thought about it. And when I did hear him say it, I felt like, yeah, it was just a, a misunderstanding of the situation. They knew they were being treated poorly, but they thought they were going to a work camp uh, you know, being sent somewhere further east. Uh, it, it was just, there was total deception surrounding everything about it, which is also why it talked about the Jews having to carry Jews' bodies to these pits and then those Jews having to get in the pits after and be killed because they don't, they don't want them surviving. They don't want people, like, they don't want other Jews to know what's going on. They would now have a shower and receive their valuables and other belongings afterwards. Undressed, the men walked first into a long corridor, walled off by barbed wire. Now it was there that the Ukrainian guards took over from the Germans. Chronic shortages of manpower 
forced the SS to rely on multitudes of foreign auxiliaries, known as Hevies or Tralniki men, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Poles were recruited to serve as guards at the extermination camps. Armed with bayonets, clubs, and whips, they broke any resistance with terrifying violence. The gas chambers themselves were crude, simple buildings, four by eight meters long, two meters high, with double wooden walls. Essential was the airtight rubber sealed door, which also had to be strong enough to resist any strong force from within. Several hundred prisoners were pressed into the small space of the gas chamber. Once the door shut behind the crowd, the lethal exhaust fumes from a dismounted Soviet tank engine were piped into the chamber. The men were so tightly packed that when the doors were again opened, the dead stood in an upright position, mouths slightly open with their hands often pressed against their chests. The women went next after fellow prisoners came to cut off their hair to be used for industrial purposes. By then, it must have dawned on many of the women what fate awaited them. The SS men also didn't care that the guards raped many of the young girls before sending them into the gas chamber. The dead were buried in large pits concealed from the train station, and Jewish workers tidied up the station platform before the next train arrived. There was a country in depression. There was a nation in despair. One man finding reasons everywhere. Then there was rising hate and anger. The pure sword is still alive. Who was to be blamed and sent to die? The final solution was a vicious cycle. Ghettos were refilled with Jews from Central Europe as the former inhabitants were sent to either labor camps or condemned to death. Each wave of roundups meant a death sentence for tens of thousands of Jews. As the SS grew in power over civil administration, the classifications changed, and more and more Jews were marked for death. New extermination camps were built as well. Treblinka, Majdanek, and Sobibor. Treblinka had little of the clean and deceptive murder machine the Nazis first envisioned. The massacres often started right at the train station as the Jews were alerted to their impending fate by the corpses lying on the ground. The camp simply killed people too fast to hide its purpose. It is estimated that Treblinka killed around 4,600 people a day. That's nearly 200 per hour, every hour. Auschwitz became the last place designated as an extermination camp, though it had been in use since early in the war as a terror camp for Polish officials and dissidents. In July 1942, it was incorporated into the final solution. While Auschwitz I was to remain mainly a concentration camp for forced labor, a second Auschwitz camp at Birkenau would experiment with new extermination techniques. The first gas chamber there opened in March 1942, and it was outfitted with crematoria for disposing of the corpses of the dead. Once the prisoners were inside the gas chambers, SS men wearing gas masks would remove the covers of the ceiling vents, opening cans of Zyklon B poison. The body heat of the people pressed into the chamber caused the Zyklon B crystals to vaporize, releasing hydrogen cyanide gas. The Jews painfully choked to death on the fumes in minutes, even seconds. Auschwitz was also the place where German doctors experimented with mass sterilization of many Jews that were not destined for immediate extermination. What had begun in 1935 would find its terrible conclusion in that year of 1942. The Nazis envisioned a final solution that would exterminate Jewish life in Europe. And as long as the war was fought, as long as the Nazis remained in power, and as long as the camps remained open, the Jews would suffer and die. The final solution was the darkest chapter in German history, and one of the darkest in our world's history. And the Holocaust is vital to be remembered as both a commemoration for its victims and as a warning to future generations 
of the depths to which humanity can sink and the atrocities that man can commit against his fellow man if the darkness and the hatred in some human souls is left unchecked and allowed to grow and fester. That's, that exact thing is why the, the madman Hitler myth bothers me. It's because it's because we don't by by claiming Hitler is something different. We don't have to take responsibility as humans for what was done. And if we don't take responsibility, then we can overlook the fact that it could easily easily be done again. There was nothing particularly special about that dude like his you know oratory skills were incredibly great but he was not particularly skilled at at very many things at all um he had a relatively normal life like he was just a person and i feel like it's incredibly important to realize that he is the same thing that we all are, right? And, and if we allow ourselves to go down a dark path, even one small step at a time, you can end up very easily in a place like this. Tyra, you've you've been to Auschwitz. I've never been there. I haven't been there yet. But you guys have been there, yeah. Yeah, uh, we we've been there two times with the the band stopping by. Uh, obviously, we play a lot of concerts in Krakow, and this is very close to Krakow. It's a place I always recommend our crew members and band members to go and visit. And uh, even though the second time we came there. I choose not to go inside. I think that one time in this place is enough. There are a lot of things in Europe from history that I would love to see. I would absolutely go, but it is not something that I would just love to see. In fact, it makes me like really uneasy to even think about going inside. I don't know. It's it's a it would be extremely difficult and it would feel incredibly bizarre to to be there even though I know for sure if I went anywhere around there traveling I would absolutely go um and honestly feel like I kind of need to go. It leaves you with uh with serious scars after you come out, that's for sure. When we wrote the song, we thought we seen so many documentaries, we read so much about Auschwitz that we we thought we could sort of be prepared to what we're gonna face. Yeah. I mean, both me and Joachim talked about this so many times afterwards that you can't get prepared for this because no matter how much you think you know about it, no, no matter how much you think that you are sort of prepared yourself um you you are absolutely seared out when yeah. you when you start to walk around there and when you walk out of there you you have there's no not anything left in you and that's why the reason is i had no reason to go in there and feel this again i encourage the other guys to go inside but i, I wouldn't go inside myself a second time um and just writing this song in the first place, I mean, it is a heavy topic, sure. But it is also to some a controversial topic. You know there are Holocaust deniers out there. You know there's people out there that... When, well, when you wrote the song, did you get reception? Did you get critique from, you know, from... We, we get 
as uh, as there can be sometimes with Sabaton, there can be people who say, "Oh, you are profiting from this," or "You you write a song to become popular about this." There are all, there are angles that people try to sort of attack the band Sabaton for what we are doing. Again, we are telling history and we are keeping it alive, and uh, we we choose, of course, not to see that we are in any way you know, promoting anything that we are singing about in the terms of, you know, we, we're just saying this happened. Yeah. But we we had a lot of people who got upset when we did this song. Okay. And uh, I think that, uh, that people get upset with it shows the power of the topic. Yeah. And uh, in one way, I think that it should just be very clear and not disputed, but it is. Well, what about... Well, as you said, you're you're telling the story of what happened. What about people that say, "No, it didn't happen"? What about them? What? Did, how did? I mean, they obviously get upset for a completely different reason. Yeah, they get upset for a, uh, for a different reason, and we had we have seen a couple of those comments as well. But in the comment section, sometimes this uh, it gets quite nasty when somebody tells like that, yeah. and uh, the f- continuation of the comments is um, leading off and into a sort of war. It's that kind of song. Okay. Well, I personally am glad that you write songs about glad. That's not what I mean, but you know what I mean. I think it's important that you write songs about even the absolute darkest parts of our history. Um, And on that note, I'm going to say goodbye for today. Never forget. Thank you for watching Sabaton History Channel. Okay, so that was Sabaton History's The Final Solution. Man, that was rough. Yeah, that was rough. Um, There's a couple of different things that I want to look at now. Uh, There's a movie made over the Nuremberg trial. Obviously, there's a movie over the Adolf Eichmann thing. Um... I may see if I can if I could get a hold of those and if I would be able to do them. But yeah, I mean I think it's an important topic and if you're going to cover history especially history of the time period you have to put it in there. Like if I wrote a history book over, you know, the 1900s and left out the Holocaust that like, I I don't know. That would be, that would seem crazy, right? Like that would seem crazy. So you can't really win here. If you're Sabaton, if you do it, people are going to get upset, but if you skip it, then it's a, a totally different thing of like, you don't want to talk about it or you know, are downplaying it or I don't know. It's just a, you you can't really win here, but it's kind of one of those topics. So anyway, as always, like, comment, subscribe, help me keep building the channel over here. I'll put the link to the discord down below and I'll see you all next time.